But I have the honor tonight, a very distinct honor, to introduce our guest speaker, our uh, distinguished speaker, Justice Mike Chibita. Uh, Justice Chibita uh, received his Bachelor of Laws degree from McCreary University in Uganda and his LLM from the University of Iowa in the United States. He has had a distinguished record of public service, and I want to just share with you some of the roles that he has served in in Uganda. He has served as the state attorney in the Attorney General's chambers, as the personal legal assistant to the Attorney General. Uh, he was the private secretary in charge of legal affairs at the State House. He was appointed by uh, President Museveni. His duties in this role were handling all legal matters at the State House and being the liaison with the Attorney General's office, Parliament, and the courts, which sounds to me like basically uh, running the entire justice system in, uh, in Uganda. He also has served as the principal private secretary to the president. And then in 2008, he was appointed as a judge at the high court. And then most recently, he has taken on the role uh, as the director of public prosecutions in Uganda. Uh, a very distinguished record of public service, but there's something else you need to know about him. And that is, he is a man who is a follower of Jesus Christ. And I first had a chance to meet him about a year ago, and I was most impressed, and it was just obvious, talking with him and his wife, Monica, that they have a heart for the Lord, of following him not just uh, on Sunday or in devotional life, but in professional life, too, and in all of life. Uh, and it was interesting, for those of you who were at the panels today, you heard him share his heart for making sure that it wasn't just him leading this way, but that he sees his responsibility as someone who supervises 500 workers in 100 different stations to not only change actions, but attitudes in the way that the Department of Public Prosecutions works. He wants to make sure to bring the rule of law into that department in a new and, and a more powerful way. Uh, he is a leader of others. He has served as the president of a Advocates Africa, the president of the Scripture Union, uh, the president of Uganda Christian Lawyers Fellowship. And so he's a man who is uh, really a part of a generation in the nation of Uganda seeking to follow Christ in all of life. And so we are so honored to have Justice Mike Chibita. Would you please join me in welcoming him tonight? Uh, thank you very much, Jeff, for that introduction. We met uh, Jeff and his wife in Hong Kong. We had gone to attend uh, a conference together, and uh, little did I know that uh, we'd be together again at, uh, at your school. Uh, it's uh, such a humbling experience to be here with you tonight and uh, to share with you some of my experiences in what I used to think was a short life. But uh, when I look back, I've lived uh, the first century of my life. And uh, as many people say, maybe majority of my years are behind me. So need to begin uh, uh, trading very, very carefully. I'm here with uh, my wife, uh, Monica Chibita. Uh, she will stand up and uh, wait to you. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, how we got to Iowa. Actually, uh, in 1990, uh, December, is uh, about uh, 23 years ago now, we had our wedding uh, in Iowa City. And, uh, I flew in from Uganda and landed on 21st December, and on 22nd, we got married and it was 20 below zero. <laughs> it was my first experience outside Uganda, my first experience with uh, winter, but uh, what we can do for love. And uh, when I look back, I can't believe that uh, it was me doing all of that. But, uh, as we were coming back, I was thinking back on that time, and again, seeing the Lord's handwork in all that. In 1971, uh, those of you old enough will know that uh, a certain, uh, I hesitate to call him gentleman, but anyway, we'll call him for lack of a better word, Idi Amin Dada took power in Uganda. 
And uh, I was in primary school then. And as uh, school children, we were required to go and, uh, and welcome the president when he was coming to our part of the country. And I could remember vividly when he flew down in a chopper and got out to address us. About 30 years later, I was on a chopper with uh, President Museveni and landing somewhere going to address, the president was going to address, and I was working for him that time. And uh, I transported myself to 30 years earlier when I had uh, been among the people welcoming the president. And I realized uh, how the Lord can uh, transport us to many different places that uh, we can never expect. I never dreamt doing any of the things that I have been able to do. But uh, when you surrender your life to the Lord, in my case, I have not been following the Lord, but the Lord has been uh, guiding me and leading me places, many times uh, screaming and wailing. And uh, it all started in uh, 1977. I, I was raised Anglican, and uh, my dad is, uh, was a school teacher. He's now retired. He's 86 years old. And uh, as children of teachers, you may know, you had to go to church every Sunday. So we grew up going to church. But uh, when I moved out of home to go to high school, I went to stay with my sister. And uh, she was going to this Pentecostal church. So one Sunday, she invited me to, to go. And uh, the preacher was preaching from Revelation 3.20. And uh, afterwards, they made an altar call. And I actually surprised myself. I, I walked to the front. And uh, because I felt uh, the Lord was knocking on the door of my heart, and I surrendered my life that day. I was a teenager. And uh, that verse says, uh, if you open, I'll come in and sup with you, and you with me. And uh, <laughs> I've realized that the Lord was very serious. God was very serious in this verse about coming in and supping with you and, uh, and me with him. Because I've tried many times to shake him off when I was a little less wise, uh, but uh, he could not let me go. So I uh, walked with the Lord, and uh, I've been to several churches. Uh, right now, we settled in a Baptist church. Actually, Monica was raised Catholic, and uh, I guess God brought both of us to the Baptist church so that uh, we could meet. Otherwise, I think we would not have met if I had remained Anglican and uh, she had stayed Catholic. I went uh, through high school, and uh, as Jim Gash knows, uh, to the best high school in Uganda. And uh, again, uh, it, it was an act of, it was a miracle. Because uh, what happened is uh, we were born 10 of us, and uh, as a school teacher, my dad could not afford to pay school fees for all of us. At that time, we didn't know, but uh, I realized it late. So when I was supposed to go to high school, uh, my dad would say, no, 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 you didn't perform well enough, so please uh, do that class again. Until uh, the, the, the next time I told him, uh, this is my last attempt. If uh, if I don't go to the next level, I am, uh, and that time Amin was recruiting. That was 79, and uh, everybody was telling me I was tall and so on, and uh, fierce looking, so I thought I would make a good soldier. <laughs> so I had made up my mind that if my dad stopped me from going to the next level the next year, I would, uh, I would join Amin's army and become a, a tough soldier and so on. But uh, that year, uh, I made it to that school, and uh, the, the problems of teenagers, you know. I, uh, every time I thought this being a Christian is such an onerous task and a boring thing and uh, a bother, and you know, I wanted to break free. I came across a verse in John chapter 6, and uh, the passage actually says at this point, many of his disciples started leaving him. And Jesus turned to 
them and said, uh, will you also go? I found this very, very interesting that uh, I, I was trying to leave the Lord, but people had left him earlier and he was challenging them that uh, would you also like to go? And Simon Peter said in verse 68, to whom shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. And uh, somehow that verse kept me. I said, okay, I could go here and here, but uh, this eternal life bit, I think I can't get it anywhere. So I went to the university eventually. At that time, we had one university in, uh, in Uganda, at Makerere, and I somehow managed to scrape it through to law school because uh, for some reason I had a passion for law and, uh, and, and that's what I wanted as well as high school. But I thought, now I'm at the university, I don't want to be bothered by these God things. I want my freedom, you know, time at the university is exploring and so on. And I had been in a fellowship which uh, was a little legalistic, uh, do's and don'ts. Uh, it's, it's amazing the things that take us because I wanted to grow my hair, something called Afro, but in that fellowship, you were not, uh, <laughs> you were not allowed to grow hair, long hair. So my friends always tease me that you always wanted to grow your hair. Why don't you grow it now? But, uh, <laughs> And, and I think the, 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 the moral behind the fellowship uh, trying to restrict us was uh, we are not to follow the fashion of the world. We are supposed to be modest and that kind. And since the fashion was uh, uh, keeping long hair, we were supposed to cut it. Of course, fashions change. And, uh, and they always said, OK, now that the fashion is keeping short hair, maybe the fellowship should grow the long hair. But anyway. <laughs> uh, Eventually, I thought, these things have no scripture foundation at all. I think uh, I need my freedom. This whole thing is confused. But again, as I said, uh, the Lord never lets us go to our own uh, uh, silly ways. So a friend of mine came and said, ah, don't worry. I reached the same conclusion. But uh, it's not a problem of Christianity. It might be a problem of that uh, one group we were with. So. He invited me to, to, to go to another fellowship, and uh, that is how God again caught me, just when I was about to go astray, and, uh, and I, I stayed. And so, in 1990, uh, of, uh, cutting out a lot of details, I, I started working. I, I joined the Attorney General's Chambers, and... Uh, what I really wanted to do with the law was uh, to set up a law firm, big law firm, make a lot of money, and uh, become uh, famous, I guess, and uh, all those things. So I wanted to get into the Attorney General's Chambers to get a bit of practice and, uh, and stabilize, and then I could go and set up my own, uh, my own chambers. I was a Christian, yes, born again, but uh, my purpose for wanting to get in the law was not yet clear. It, it was definitely not about ministry, but uh, about, uh, about making it big. And of course, that's when uh, the things of love came in, and, uh, and then I abandoned my work for some time, and uh, came to Iowa, and uh, did uh, a master's in law, while, uh, because uh, I thought, uh, it was not too manly to follow the love of your heart and just concentrate on being a husband. I said, I need to do something else, otherwise uh, I might not be taken very seriously. So, but uh, again, uh, first time outside Uganda, completely at a loss. But uh, the Lord always goes ahead of us, most times for me. So when we got to Iowa City, when Monica got there, she got there ahead of me, we met uh, this couple, uh, Keith and Carol Plate, and they had been in Nigeria working with the Navigators for 25 years. So they had just also returned, and they said, please uh, feel at home. If there's anything that you don't understand, we also don't understand many things. We are just trying to relearn our country. So they uh, welcomed us and made us feel at home in their place. And they were such a blessing because, uh, as you will appreciate, uh, the, the, the 
cultural shock and, and, and so many things. One of the things that, uh, that uh, I was told was that I, I was speaking with an accent and uh, I didn't understand what that meant. <laughs> but uh, eventually we, we adjusted and we really enjoyed our time in, uh, in Iowa City. And as if Iowa City was not cold enough, we moved to Minneapolis, and, uh, <laughs> and, and Monica really doesn't like the cold, but uh, she got an opportunity to work at uh, Northwestern Radio Station because she's in the field of journalism. And again, we met uh, some wonderful people there. Paul Ramsey, who was vice president for radio at Northwestern College, uh, invited us, and we spent a year. I did some teaching there as well. Through all this, uh, just showed me that uh, the Lord is the owner of the universe. Uh, he prepares for us long before we can prepare for ourselves. So when we least expect it. So we reached a point, of course, uh, the US is a very nice place to be and uh, we're having a nice time. But both of us felt like, uh, because Monica had come on a Fulbright and uh, she was required to go back. Of course, you know, doesn't mean that because you are required to go back, you have to go back. But uh, both of us were agreed that uh, I think we had uh, work to do in Uganda. So we, we agreed eventually to go. We had our first, uh, our first child uh, in, uh, in St. Paul, Minnesota. He's now 20, 20 years old. And uh, he's the second year and he's Monica's student at the university. But uh, we packed him up when he was, uh, I think, one month and, and we headed back home. Challenges of settling in and that kind of thing. But uh, again, uh, the Lord's faithfulness going uh, ahead of us. So <laughs> I got back and I thought I should go back to the Attorney General's chambers. But uh, they told me that, uh, you know what, uh, as some of you have read the book, you, know, uh, you left unceremoniously, your place is no longer here. And I thought, okay, I think now this gives me the opportunity to go and do what I've wanted all along, to build that big law practice. But uh, I went to talk to the Solicitor General, who was my boss, and I had been in touch with him. Uh, I told him, yes, I had come back, but uh, there's no place for me anymore, so I'm off. And uh, he, he, he said, no, I am not aware of that. Uh, just hold on. Anyway, long story short, he reversed uh, the decision, and, uh, and I stayed on. And you have heard some of the things I did. Eventually, I, in 1998, I got a call from, uh, uh, from somebody in Washington, D.C. Uh, many of you will know Sam Erickson, uh, now deceased. There's a young lady who had uh, come to our church, Kampala Baptist Church. She was studying at Wheaton, and uh, I didn't even know her. But uh, she eventually went to work with Sam, and Sam was trying to put together a collection of Christian lawyers from uh, across, the, across the world. And so this young lady, who I didn't know she had been in our church six months, uh, uh, proposed my name to Sam. And uh, we came for, for a conference, started uh, Advocates International, basically got involved. And uh, through this involvement with Advocates International, I got a new, a new revelation, a new meaning about what it was to be <clears throat> a Christian lawyer, a lawyer in the service of the Lord. And uh, Sam taught us uh, something about uh, stewardship, that uh, we are not owners of anything, but we are stewards. And that changed my perspective about, uh, about the law. I've seen uh, Regent Law School, Law is not just a profession, it is a calling. And I started realizing that uh, law is uh, <clears throat> such a powerful tool uh, to really just use it to accumulate wealth or get money is uh, misusing it, or it's just using a, a little percentage of it. So I dived into this and uh, did many, many things which I had never thought. and. Uh, Eventually, for the first time, I thought maybe I could stay in the public service. I don't have to, to go and set up that law firm. Maybe there is a purpose for my being here. So uh, around that time, the Solicitor General 
with whom we had established a very good rapport and uh, he came to rely on me and, and it's because of again as a Christian at the workplace you have to try and be exemplary work ethic time management and all those kinds of things so he told me the president needs uh, a state attorney to work very closely with him and I'm nominating you to go and I told him I cannot go to work for that man. He's a very difficult man from what I've heard. And uh, thank you, but no thank you. So the Solicitor General said, uh, but you have not prayed about it. How can you just turn it down like that? <laughs> so I said, OK, OK, I will uh, I'll go and pray about it. We prayed about it, talked about it with Monica. And uh, eventually, I went to work for the president. A very scary uh, kind of thought. Uh, our president is a, is a very, uh, very brilliant person, actually, uh, very hardworking. And uh, so to be near him is uh, to try <laughs> to expose yourself, actually. So I, I was a bit scared because I, I was not very sure about uh, my legal expertise. But uh, the Solicitor General said, uh, aren't you a lawyer? Don't you know where to find the law? So what is the problem? I went and um, I was supposed to work there three years. <clears throat> I ended up staying for seven years. And again, many things happened. But uh, the Lord showed me that uh, once he, you, once you surrender to him, and, and I'm not saying I was a holy person or that I'm a holy person, but uh, that notwithstanding our weaknesses or our failures, the Lord uh, will can use you. So I, uh, I would find myself on the presidential.
Uh, one day, I got a call and uh, I was told that, uh, okay, uh, there is a position of director for public prosecution. Um, let's uh, begin thinking about that. Now, you know, I, I think everywhere, when you become a judge, <laughs> you settle. You <laughs> Judgeship is not a transitory kind of uh, place. It's not a place you, you transit to other places. It's a place where you reach and say, I will retire from here. So I, I was ready I, to, to retire from, uh, from, that, from the bench because what you do again after, after being a judge. So this call uh, took me completely by surprise. And uh, one advantage of uh, the job would be that now I would come back to Kampala so I told uh, my dear wife that uh, your prayers have been answered. <clears throat> I am likely to take this job. And she said, uh, if it is coming to Kampala for that job, then you had better stay where you are, which was in Fort Porto. Uh, Fort Porto is her home area, actually. <clears throat> but uh, a director of public prosecution, <laughs> uh, as, as, as you've heard, uh, has a staff of over 500 uh, people. In our constitution, uh, director of public prosecution uh, is under the control or authority of nobody. Nobody tells the director of public prosecution what to do or what not to do. Uh, he's in control of the directorate. He decides who to prosecute and who not to prosecute. As a matter of fact, as I'm here, there are some files who nobody else can touch because I, they must have my, my signature. If somebody is being charged of uh, corruption, embezzlement, abuse of office, terrorism, I have to sign and consent to those charges. Personally, I cannot delegate that power under the Constitution. Under the Constitution, I cannot delegate the power to withdraw a case against anybody from the whole country. So as, as I'm away, work is accumulating. But it is, uh, it is also a lot, of, uh, a lot of power, a lot of work. So, and uh, of course, everybody wants to try and uh, influence the director of public prosecution. Everybody wants to try and... Uh, use them to prosecute uh, either their enemy or withdraw charges against their friend. So it is from that background that Monica was thinking, no, 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 I think we need uh, some peace. It's, you stay as a judge and stay as far away as you, uh, but uh, this job. But again, there, there's a book which I both haven't read uh, called, uh, entitled, When God Interrupts. It is, it's, it's a bold title, but Sometimes I felt like, wow, God is interrupting me a bit too much. Just when I'm settling on something, uh, he interrupts. But again, we prayed through this job offer. Uh, from the time when I, I was told about the job to the time I took it up, it was a period of about 12 months. And again, the Lord used this time to, to speak to us and especially to speak my, to my wife. And uh, one of the things that uh, the Lord talked to us about was uh, this is a very vital, important job in the rule of law. Uh, as many of you know, the kingdom of God, I've been told, is built on uh, justice and righteousness. And justice is uh, to be enforced by us, our lawyers, and uh, law enforcement, and, and the rest. Of course, righteousness, uh, there are some people working on that and us as, as individuals. Now, if the Christians don't want to take up these challenges, who will it be? And so through this, uh, eventually, I, uh, I took up this job. There are several challenges with, uh, with this job. <clears throat> For volume of work, <laughs> I, I think nothing beats it. On an average day, I have 20 files to work through. 
Of course, at that level, you can no longer read files and study them. You have to rely on the opinion of others. I have over 500 staff, and uh, you have to spot among those 500 who you rely on, who you say, if Jim has sent me his opinion, 90% uh, I can rely on it. 109 stations countrywide. And as a judge, I was supervising uh, five people, my bodyguard, my driver, my secretary, my uh, manageable number. Now I'm in charge of 500. And those of you who deal with HR know that uh, each human being comes with a complexity of problems. <laughs> now 500 of them and uh, 250 of them are lawyers. You can. <laughs> so the, the work is, uh, is quite a lot. This is the first challenge. The second challenge is uh, it's a government body, and uh, you see where you want to go, but uh, the resources are not there to go there. Uh, one of the biggest offenses we are prosecuting now are cases involving uh, uh, embezzlement of government funds through the office of the prime minister. And uh, you know, this was done through the computers and that kind of thing. 90% of my officers don't have computers, so to tell them to prosecute a case where fraud has taken place through computers is a, is a big challenge because uh, you first have to teach them that this is a computer and so on and so on. The filing system is, uh, is manual, you know. We register 130,000 on average cases, criminal cases a year. Now all these are manual files. So I want to know a case in uh, station 109. Ordinarily, in the modern world, I should tap on a computer and know where a lot of details about that one file. Now here, I have to call and ask and so on and so on. And it will take a bit, about maybe two days before I find out exactly where the file is and that kind of thing. And by that time, I'm looking for five other files. So you, you want to computerize the registry, but uh, <laughs> you don't have the resources. So th this, these are some of the challenges. And you say, Lord, uh, wh why, why do you give me the task? when I don't have the means to do it. But again, uh, God is able to, to provide. I came across a verse in Ephesians 3.20. I, I came across it very late in, in my Christian life. But uh, I loved it, uh, Ephesians 3.20, to him who can exceedingly, abundantly provide much more than we can ever think or pray. So it is him that uh, when we get all these challenges, I know that uh, he can never send you without uh, equipping you and, and all that. And uh, I came across a saying which is equivalent to the one of uh, God give us the serenity to know the things we cannot change, the grace to change the things we can, and the, the courage to know the difference. I may have mixed it up, and I think I have. <laughs> But uh, I think it was attributed to Plato where I said that uh, there are things in our control and there are things not in our control. And uh, there are many things within our control. So when I face all these challenges, I know that uh, there are many things within my control which I can do. And the others not in my control, but uh, definitely they are in the Lord's control. One of the other challenges is uh, after the Lord has uh, taken me so far through so many offices, there's always the fear. And uh, the fear comes in this way. Will I not let God down? Suppose uh, I do something abominable, I commit a serious sin and so on. I will have let God down. And, and that fear can... Uh, overwhelm you and overcome you and paralyze you. But it is always comforting to know that uh, we can never let God down. 
Um, he uses us notwithstanding what our sins are, what our weaknesses are. And so I take it uh, one day at a time and um, I started this job on October 14th, this uh, last year. So I've been just a few months in it and I've told people that uh, now that I've not drowned in the job, I, I think I will survive it. A lot of people have been praying for, for us, for me, and uh, that is one of the overwhelming things. People said uh, we were praying about uh, a Christian in that office, and uh, we are praying for you. And amidst all those challenges, I know it is an opportunity uh, to represent uh, Christian principles, Christian values, and uh, a chance to try and do the right thing. <clears throat> One of the other difficult things is uh, <clears throat> I, I have always worked and, uh, and had a boss, you know. <laughs> Most jobs have a, have a boss. Uh, even as a judge, you have the chief justice, the principal judge as a boss, and you can report to them, you can uh, take to them difficult cases. Uh, as, I, as I told you, the director of public prosecutions has no boss among the, the mottos. You make your decision. In fact, the first, first few weeks, I kept wanting to share the decision with somebody and say, this is what I've decided. Is it right? And there was nobody. <laughs> uh, and as a judge, you can, you can consult your colleagues and, uh, and so on. So it is... Uh, very, very important, and uh, it is an opportunity and privilege to know that uh, the Lord is, uh, is, is my boss, is my client, is the one I'm answerable to and report to. Even when I think there's nobody I can consult, I always, uh, and uh, therefore I'm forced, even when I don't want, I'm forced to take the decisions before the Lord and say, this is what I... I think is, is going to happen. And uh, the Lord comes and uh, many times guides me. I've been honored to be invited to share some few experiences. I thought for tonight I should just uh, share with you my journey and uh, the workings of the Lord. Mysterious. Uh, but the faithfulness of the Lord. We deal with a lot of corruption. Corruption cases uh, is a major thing. As I told the group earlier, my staff through many ways tell me that, uh, you know, we are not well paid and that kind of thing, so you should not be too hard on us if we are involved in some uh, in Swahili, it's called kitu kidogo, meaning a small thing. Huh? <clears throat> and I told them, uh, if I turn a blind eye to corruption within my own institution, what moral authority will I have to prosecute anybody else? And indeed, different people come to me and say, now on this one, why don't you go slow and that kind of thing? But I realized that uh, I cannot do that. I have to set a standard. I have to be fair. I have to be justice, and I have to uphold the values. So I've told everybody that uh, I will prosecute uh, criminals both within and without. Of course, uh, some people think that uh, the president appointed me so that uh, I, can, uh, I can persecute his political opponents. And the media has put this to me several times and uh, said, uh, we hear the president gave you a list of untouchables, people you can't prosecute. And I've told them uh, the only list I know about of untouchables is uh, people have not committed an offense. Anybody who commits an offense is uh, touchable. There is no such other list. I 
And the Lord has been faithful. It also leads me to think about uh, mortality, you know. Uh, at 50, you begin thinking about uh, time is running out, as I said. And, and, and the Lord was gracious enough to show this to me. About uh, four years ago, I got an explained uh, sickness. I was losing weight. I was sweating. My heart was palpitating. Uh, eventually, I was diagnosed with something called hyperthyroidism. It's a mouthful, I knew nothing. I think we had studied about the thyroid in high school, but I had uh, slept through the lesson. So I was reminded about the thyroid and its functions, and apparently I had a problem with my thyroid, and uh, it was releasing too much of that hormone, so the body was getting, the brain was getting the message that I'm running, so it was releasing, and so I was sweating. Anyway, uh, for the first time I realized that, okay, I'm not invisible. Before that, I had uh, not had any serious sickness. But you think about that, and uh, in my current job, you are stepping on many toes. Uh, people with big money, uh, they tell you that if you will not take the money, then uh, they will have to, to eliminate you. So I, I think about that, but it doesn't paralyze me because I know that, uh, that it is the Lord who determines when uh, we exit and my job is to do my job. As I conclude, uh, to illustrate the complexity of corruption, a friend of mine told me this story about a traffic cop in Nigeria. You know, traffic policemen are some of the, the, the most corrupt in our part of the world. So this gentleman was driving alone at about 7 p.m. And uh, he was flagged down, and the traffic man said, ah, your car is, everything is okay. So he had no fault. And the traffic man said, but uh, why are you driving alone at this hour of the night? And the gentleman said, I'm not alone. I'm with God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. I am also with St. Peter and St. John and St. James. And the traffic man said, okay, in that case, you have put all those people in this one small car. I charge you with overloading. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat> my Lord, Justice Chibita, and Mrs. Chibita for being with us. We're so grateful to have you all here, and we're thankful to hear from your heart this evening, so we appreciate that. My name is Abby Skeens. I am a third-year student here at Regent Law, and I was asked to share with you just a little bit about the Center for Global Justice, Human Rights, and the Rule of Law from the student perspective. Um, and I want to start by sharing with you the story of a young lady whose life has really inspired my own. Um, this young lady seemed like the most unlikely candidate to be a reformer in her nation. Um, her background was not one of influence. She didn't have really the right family connections. Um, her socioeconomic background didn't allude to the fact that she would ascend to a powerful position someday. And yet the Lord called her out from among her peers. And he asked her to go through a time of, of refinement, of, of training, of education. And then when that time was over, he gave her a voice and a platform and an opportunity, and she prevented the genocide of her people. And you might recognize this story as the story of Esther from the Old Testament in the Bible. And like Esther, I feel that my life is very similar to that and that I don't have any special family connections <laughs> like many of the colleagues in this profession. I don't come from a prestigious socioeconomic background and I probably look like the most unlikely of people who the Lord would choose to use. And yet he calls us out from among our other peers and he asks us to go through a period of refinement and testing and challenge and education known as law school. <laughs> And after he uses that time, he gives us a voice and an opportunity and a platform to be able to be used by him. And unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to provide or prevent the genocide of a nation, um, but perhaps the Lord has used me already through the Center for Global Justice's investing in me over the last three years. 
Um, and ever since I came here, Dean Brauch has been my cheerleader. He has believed in the call in my life, and I'm not the only one. I'm not unique. He believes in every student who walks through the doors of this school, and we're grateful for that. But through him raising up the Center for Global Justice, Human Rights, and the Rule of Law, countless students before me and during my time here and after me will be provided with the opportunity to go around the world every single year and through all of the world, work with organizations, governments, institutions that are reforming and building really to advance the kingdom and to change things. And so we're grateful for that opportunity, and I would ask you just to continue investing in the lives of students like myself. Thank you very much. Well, I think you get a glimpse of why I have the best job in the world. Uh, it is just such a blessing to spend my days with people like Abby and other students in this room, like Heather, who you heard from earlier today, the students who really work so hard to put this event together. Um, you know, you, you think about the challenges that we've been talking about today, the challenges of corruption, the lack of a rule of law so often throughout the world. Uh, you think of numbers like 27 to 30 million, the estimate on the number of slaves in the world today, or 100 million street kids in the world, and the numbers and the, it, it just seems so daunting. Kind of like the story you told, Jim, about the, the starfish, the, the beach seems littered with starfish, impossible to throw them all in. But what encourages me and what gives me hope are these young people that I hang out with every day. And I see hope in their eyes. And I see the call of God on their lives. Uh, and I get to see them then leave and go and do and sometimes come back like Ernie Walton is now the administrative director of the center and others who are out and, and, and working as God's called them to do. And it gives me incredible joy and hope that God is at work. And um, I was thinking about tonight and it was a dinner not unlike this about three and a half years ago that we launched the Center for Global Justice. And I just want to praise God with you for what he's done in a very short time. Um, this is our third symposium now. And as I listened today and saw in the, in the, the level of speakers and the level of dialogue that happened, I praise the Lord that the Center for Global Justice is here and, and brought this group together. Uh, I praise the Lord that the curriculum of this school looks different today than it did four years ago. For courses like uh, Professor Thompson's Rule of Law, International Development and the Rule of Law course, uh, that I heard described earlier today as life-changing. And I'm not surprised by that. Or by the practicums that we now have. We have an immigration law practicum where students are working on asylum cases, helping people persecuted for their faith come to this country uh, and, and preserve their lives and continue on serving Christ. Uh, or our uh, child advocacy practicum, whose work this year through an amicus brief actually led to a change in Virginia law. I praise the Lord for that. I praise the Lord for the, uh, the internships. Uh, at this point, 60 students, like Abby and Heather uh, and Kara, who's here as an alum, have gone out and worked all over the world, working with great organizations in ways that have been life-changing for our students. I know because I talk to them when they get back and it's so exciting when I hear the stories, but life-changing for the people they went to serve as well. And I'm thankful for the jobs that God is giving our students and our alumni through this. I'll just tell you one story about this, and that's Kirk's story. Many of you know Kirk Schweitzer. Kirk went to East Africa uh, maybe a year and a half ago on one of these internships. Um, through the connections he made and the things that he learned, he now has a job with an organization that's sending him to Nepal. And so we're about a month away from Kirk Schweitzer going to Nepal uh, to work with an organization trying to prevent young women from being trafficked from Nepal into India and working with law enforcement to change the lives of women in that country. I praise the Lord for that and I, I give him all the glory 
for the things that he has done through the Center for Global Justice. And I, what I want to do is just ask for your help in two ways tonight. One is I ask for your prayers. Uh, you know, things like corruption, trafficking of persons, abuse, oppression, they are very physical, real harms in this world. But there's a spiritual component to them. There is a, there's a spiritual battle that takes place regarding these matters and that allows them to thrive in this world. If this center is to continue to work in this field and make a difference, we need God's intervention and we need his, his involvement. This is a spiritual matter every bit as it's much as it's a, just a physical thing. And I'm so thankful that as Professor Craig Stern has taken on the, the directorship, the executive directorship of this organization, the first thing he did was get together a group of people to pray every day. He's got a prayer team working. And I would ask you, please join that team. Tom Luna told me he prays every day for the Center for Global Justice. Thank you. And I know there are others in this room who do. Would you be, please be part of that group praying for this? I also ask if you would just prayerfully consider tonight financial support for the Center for Global Justice, and in particular, one part of the center, and that is the internships. Uh, Abby didn't share with you some of the amazing work she has done in juvenile justice around the world, in, in Uganda particularly, but also Malawi, or the work that she did in South Sudan as God led her there. It's unbelievable what God has done in these internships. And 60 people have now gone out in funded internships. And I, and I praise the Lord for that too, because I don't want our students as they go out in these internships borrowing money to do it or having to raise money. I want them to go and be supported. And so many people like you in this room have funded these internships. And what I'm going to ask you to do tonight is just prayerfully consider whether God would have you contribute toward the internships that we hope to do this summer. We're going to send out, again, Lord willing, 20 or so students all over the world doing uh, amazing work with organizations making a difference. Now, I realize as I'm standing here, many of you in this room are students. I, please feel no compulsion to give to the Center for Global Justice uh, unless God's put this on your heart. I, I don't want anyone in this room to feel undue pressure to do something tonight that God's not leading you to do. But I do ask that you would just listen to the Lord and if God's leading you to help support people like Heather and Abby and those who are going to go out this year, I ask that you would do it. Our, our internships cost about $5,000 per person to cover the expenses for travel, living, and so forth. And some of you in this room have the capacity to, to sponsor a student or more. And I would ask that if you do, and if God's put that on your heart, would you sponsor a student this summer? That's a lot of money. And I know many of you in this room are not in a position that you can do that. And what I want you to know is that gifts of any size make a difference in the lives of our students and help us do the work that we believe God's called us to do. And so my, my request is simply this, just prayerfully consider whether God would have you give money toward the students who are going to go out this summer toward these internships that are really making a difference. Whatever God puts on your heart from nothing to sponsoring our whole internship program this summer, that would be fine too. Um, but, you know, God's call at all times to his people and his church is to speak for those who can't, cannot speak for themselves, to defend the rights of the poor and needy. And I would ask that as you prayerfully consider this, consider sponsoring our interns who do that very thing each summer. So thank you.